got character, got basic scenario, or even some scenes. Figured out your angst, your traitors, your twists. What next in story development? Maybe this episode can help. We're looking at three strong plotting methods, including the one that the one that I tell everyone about. It's Chapter Three, Part D. A plot it, one guiding decision from Think Like a Pro by M. A. Lee. Welcome to the Right to Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, headed up by M. A. Lee, with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Runes, all from Writers Inc. is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Show notes for this and other episodes can be found on therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at winkbooks at aol.com. Our podcast episodes last as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, drive a short commute, dinner, drive a short commute, or take a brisk walk. We're bookcasting with Think Like a Pro by M.A. Lee, copyright 2017 and revised 2018. Today, we cover the last two of five standard plotting methods, as well as another just discovered, Kishota Ketsu, an Asian plot, an Asian plot method that originated in China. We have a Korean form as well as Kisho Tenketsu, which is the Japanese form. Kisho Tenketsu, which I'm probably pronouncing wrongly, is the hot plotting method in classes on the craft of plot. For those curious, we have a brief overview 50 years ago, so it's not new. None of these are. Last week, we looked at Freytag's Pyramid, taught in high schools, as if it is gospel. Freytag's, however, is too simplistic for writers. We then took an in-depth look at the Shakespeare five-act structure with examples from Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Macbeth, Much Ado About Nothing, and Henry V. The five-act structure is great when we know what we're doing. Similar to Shakespeare's structure is complex plot, which depends on the push-pull dynamic between protagonist and antagonist, with narrative hook, conflict, complications, climax, and resolution or denouement. Complex plot is best described as a roller coaster structure. Time to start today with our fourth method of plot. It's the four act movement. It works for many people. Act one is introduce the trouble. When the trouble starts, the protagonist thinks, I can, I can solve this problem. His solution is not the answer. It makes things worse. This leads to act the second, doubled trouble. The fix caused more problems that spread like the flu in unexpected directions, or like the coronavirus. Our protagonist now says, okay, this wasn't what I expected or wanted. This wasn't what I expected or wanted, but I'm good. I can work it out. However, here comes act the third, the crisis point. Trouble triples, increasing in physical danger and intellectual suffering and emotional angst. Our protagonist can't go back. Retreating will only make the problem worse. Going for only option. Damned if I do and damned if I don't. His dilemma requires that he abandon or sacrifice his first desired goal. He will question his purpose in continuing on. Act the fourth seems all lost. But the protagonist knows, I can't give up. I've come too far. There's nobility too far. There's nobility in dying courageously. I won't give up. So the protagonist takes the necessary and essential and most difficult steps and tumbles into the story's end, which is the trouble's end. This is the epiphany of love and life. I'm going to shift now to that hot plotting method, Kishoten to the four-act structure. According to my research, it is the plotting method of Asian narratives. It originated in China, also used in Korea. The word Kishotenketsu is Japanese. All three follow the same four-act structure, and supposedly the structure is not bound to conflict. An introduction, then structure, is not bound to conflict. An introduction, then hardship or complications, This is sounding very like Shakespeare. The third act is the difference. It's called reversal, our twist, our turning point, which sounds like Shakespeare's five-act structure, but it's not. The difference continues into the fourth act, which is the conclusion, conclusion, or where the third act twist resolves with acts one and two, a reconciliation of the beginning with the twist. That's what's in the last act. That third act twist is an unexpected development of the story. It contains the most important element, the yama or climax. As explanation, Wikipedia presents from Sanyo Rai, 
Daughters of Itoya, which is in the Hamachi of Osaka. And I probably just pronounced all of those wrongly. I'll link to the Wikipedia article in the show notes. Sanyo Ra lived 1780 to 1832. I'm going to use his story as an example of Kisho Taketsu. It's in the public domain. It's in the public domain by now. In Acts 1 and 2 of the Daughters of Itoya, we meet the two daughters, one 16 and the other 14. The development presents their youth, then how they are associated with violence. Remember the Act 3 twist? In Twist, we discover that, let me quote, Myos, who are powerful feudal lords under the rule of a shogun and the emperor who protected the people. Anyway, throughout history, Damyos killed the enemy with bows and arrows. This is totally not expected after two acts with the sweet young daughters of Itoya. We can anticipate, however, that they are like the Damyos. Sure enough, in Act 4, we discover that, quoting again, the daughters of Itoya kill with their eyes. I assume they are magical Damyos that bad people would not expect. According to Wikipedia, they seduce men with their eyes, killing them just as the, until now, unrelated generals kill with bows and arrows. Now, everyone says this is a story structure without conflict. Actually, the conflict, the young women's special powers, is hidden in Acts 1 and 2, apparently, with no foreshadowing. Without seeing a translation of the Daughters of Atoya and other stories in the Hanmachi of Osaka, I cannot state with any certainty that there is no conflict or foreshadowing. They might be there. The conflict and foreshadowing might be there as hidden metaphors and symbols. The third act twist or turning point may be an unexpected complication. It certainly directs us to the end, which is actually expected now. now. Niels Odlin, in an article entitled Kisho Taketsu for Beginners, and I'll link to that as well, has a made-up story to explain this Asian plotting method, which is flooding the writing world. You can find the article on Mythic Scribes, The Art of Fantasy Storytelling. Act 1, Arki introduces a fisherman on his seafaring boat. He hasn't caught enough fish. Act 2, Arsho, Kisho, the fisherman decides to return home to his family, which he loves much more than he loves the sea. 10, Kisho Ten, Act 3, gives us the unexpected twist. Let me quote, quote, Odlin. The third act is about a woman hiding in the forest with two crying children. She is the fisherman's wife, and she's hiding because their village got attacked by brigands. She's not actively confronting the brigands. However, that is conflict. Act 4, Ketsu. Kisho Ten kept his wife and children in the destroyed village. They use his boat to find another village. I have greatly paraphrased Odlin, but we can see how his story matches to the Daughters of Atoya in that unpredicted third act. While the fourth act of the Daughters of Atoya then clearly links the first two acts with the third, we don't have that. Links the first two acts with the third. We don't have that in Odlin's story. The hiding wife and children and the attacking brigands are not at all hinted or foreshadowed in Acts 1 and 2, unless symbolically. We could have those hidden symbols, a red sun burning his flesh, swimming sharks that make it impossible to bring in and provide them. He calls the third act not a conflict, but presenting tension. The contrast I'm quoting here, the contrast between what we've seen in the past, the fisherman on his way home after a day in the sea, and what we're seeing at the moment, the village being ransacked, as well as the fearful mother trying to keep keep terrified children quiet. That's the tension. Odlin tells us to plan a Kisho Tenketsu story by making a list of what each of the four acts need to achieve. Kisho Tenketsu is not Shakespeare's structure or any Occidental story structure that depends on the early introduction of the conflict. Romeo and Juliet. And Juliet starts with a street fight to introduce the feud between the families. Hamlet opens with the ghost. Macbeth with the witches. In Western stories, conflict is predominant action and its reaction, antagonist outwitting the protagonist and often destroying the protagonist's dearest desire, which sets sets the protagonist on his hero's journey. An Asian narrative opens with a character in seeming or actual harmony with the universe. We have serenity and the knowledge that the characters are content with their purpose. 
Act three gives us the disruption of that harmony. We, the audience, and the aware writer reading to learn reconciliation of act three with the first two acts. But we don't know, not until we have act four. Then we should go back and look for hidden clues. Whatever we think, notice that the characters in act four the fisherman and his family, and the daughters of Atoya are fulfilling the purpose that restores their harmony. The purpose that restores their harmony. In Sanyo Rai, we may have an actual conflict between the daughters and the men. I need a translation to know. In Odlin's fisherman story, we only see the after result of the brigands' attack. We don't have the fishermen confronting the brigands. We would in a Western culture story or any other Western plotting method. I can't say which one is better. On to method five. This is the plotting method that I use. I don't use Freytags or Shakespeare or complex plot, although for many years I used complex plot. I have been guilty of teaching Freytags and Shakespeare's and complex, guilty of teaching Freytags and Shakespeare's and complex as if they are gospel. I use the archetypal story structure as presented by Christopher Vogler in his book, The Writer's Journey, which builds on Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey work on the monomyth. Those will be linked. For some reason, the 12 step brain. Now, Campbell has 17 stages, but Vogler reduces them. The ordinary world presents the protagonist in his normal world from which he will be ripped. The call to adventure is the event that will catapult him from his ordinary world complacency into reaching for a new desire. In the refusal of the call, new desire. In the refusal of the call, no protagonist should be an idiot. Seeing danger ahead, most protagonists should hesitate. But staying in the ordinary world is impossible. J. R. R. Tolkien's The Hobbit does this very well. Bilbo doesn't want to go on a great adventure. He's very The wizard Gandalf says just the right thing to give him the impetus to set out on that journey. Basically, he'll become just like his boring relatives if Bilbo doesn't take the journey. He definitely doesn't want to that. The next stage is meeting with the mentor. In order to begin the necessary changes, the protagonist changes. The protagonist needs a guide. Gandalf is Bilbo's mentor, but the Hobbit also finds that the dwarves, consciously and unconsciously, have things to teach him. A chief lesson is about narrow-mindedness. In seeing theirs, he despises his own. Crossing the first threshold, is the protagonist willing to find its capabilities and start changing? The encounter with the trolls serves as this step for Bilbo. He must use his wit and his wits to escape their cooking pot. Test, Allies and Enemies is the series of adventures, both setbacks and achievements, think complications, that continue the protagonist change from his original from his original complacent self into an individual who confronts personal fears and overcomes them. These events give our protagonist the skills to survive to the end of the story. Test, allies, and enemies can be repeated numerous times. The approach to the inmost cave proves the protagonist has changed and is ready to to face his greatest fear. At the 60 to 70 percent mark of the story, we have the ordeal, sometimes called the dark moment, which requires more and unexpected sacrifices from the protagonist. He faces the supreme enemy here, not just overwhelming numbers, but also the evil most like himself. In the thousands of goblins, Bilbo encounters Gollum. Both are witty, selfish, secretive, and wily. The worst enemies are most like ourselves. A reward comes unexpectedly to the protagonist after he escapes the dark moment. This reward is better than the world he abandoned and the goal he had to sacrifice before he reached the dark moment. More troubles occur in the road back. Then the evil antagonist returns in the resurrection in a worse form. Smog in the Hobbit is a gigantic and fiery golem in many ways. The protagonist comes closer to death here than at any previous point and survives. For the return with the elixir, with a new and better goal decided upon, the protagonist returns to his ordinary world. He is changed much better than he began. Whatever plot method you pick, Freytag, Shakespeare, Complex, Four Act, Kishotoketsu, are the archetypal story pattern. Pick your method wisely. Deciding on the plot structure that will impose order on the chaos that story can become is the best guiding decision you can make. First, determine what type of plot you will write. 
Then determine your protagonist's major steps through the story using one of these six methods. Pick six. Pick six. Make the right decision for your writing. Before we leave this chapter on one guiding decision plotted, we have the classic argument between two writer's camps. It's a real slugfest. Plotter or panster or something else. This episode can help every time you sit down to write. It's about the writing process. It's Wednesday on The Right Focus. Until then, write on.